Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning. Welcome to St. Peter's Lutheran Church on this Lord's Day. Today is our annual meeting. After the closing hymn, uh, we'll have the meeting, but as we're getting a little set up for the meeting, I've been told that if you'd like to go grab a cup of coffee, you're, you're welcome to do that, but then we'll meet in here immediately after worship for the annual meeting. And then there's a potluck. And for children downstairs, there's a a movie during that time, so they can have something to enjoy before we all eat together. We're excited to have special music today from the Sunday School and also from Mira DeGroat. And we're so glad you're here. And as we do when we have visiting artists from outside our congregation, we remember that we have this visiting artist fund that we like to build up so we are able to invite more and more people to come and share their gifts with us of music. And so the, the plate on the side and in the back today, that contributes to the visiting artist fund. Please contribute as you're able. Please take note of all the announcements in your bulletin. Next Sunday, there'll be a brief meeting after worship for those who are serving during the Lenten suppers, for the Wednesday suppers. Also, next Sunday, we'll have a meeting during the fellowship hour for our 125th anniversary committee. Are there any announcements from the congregation this morning? Well, then let's stand as we begin with the confession as printed in your bulletin. Almighty God, We confess that we have sinned against you and against our neighbors. We hesitate to share our full selves with you, afraid that your light will expose our sinfulness. We hold on to our old ways, shying away from the new birth you offer. We resist the movement of your Holy Spirit. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves, nor have we loved our enemies. Forgive us, renew us by your Holy Spirit, and empower us to start anew. Let's take a moment for silent confession and reflection. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so Jesus was lifted up on the cross, so that everyone who believes in him may be forgiven and have eternal life. Know that you have been forgiven, that today is a new start. We have been forgiven. Thank you, God. We will strive to live in the spirit and trust in Jesus. Let's sing, Dearest Jesus, at your word.
The prayer of the day is printed in your bulletin. Let's pray this together. Birthing God, you gave us new life when we were born of water and spirit. Help us live into that new life, refreshed and renewed for your work. Amen. And you can remain standing as the, the gospel reading is shared today. Our scripture reading today is from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. There was a Jewish leader named Nicodemus who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. One night he went to Jesus and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher sent by God. No one could perform the miracles you are doing unless God were with him. Jesus answered, I am telling you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. How can a grown man be born again? Nicodemus asked. He certainly cannot enter his mother's womb and be born a second time. I am telling you the truth, replied Jesus, that no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. A person is born physically of human parents, but is born spiritually of the spirit. Do not be surprised because I tell you that you must all be born again. The wind blows wherever it wishes. You hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. It is like that with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can this be? asked Nicodemus. Jesus answered, You are a great teacher in Israel, and you don't know this? I am telling you the truth. We speak of what we know and report what we have seen, yet none of you is willing to accept our message. You do not believe me when I tell you about the things of this world. How will you ever believe me then when I tell you about the things of heaven? And no one has ever come up to heaven except the Son of Man, who came down from heaven. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone in, who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its Savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged, but those who do not believe have already been judged, because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds are evil. Those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deeds to, be show, to show up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. And we'll invite the children to come up for uh, some special music this morning. The Sunday school kiddos have been practicing a song, and I hear... They've been writing some lyrics, too. Yeah, so while the kids are coming up, I'll just let you know, um, in Sunday school in the last month, we've been talking a little bit about how each of one of us is unique and different, but how Jesus loves us all, no matter, and how when we all come together with our special talents, we can form a great church like St. Peter's for the last 125 years. So last week, um, so this is a little last moment, last week we wrote some words of our own to Jesus Loves the Little Children. So this is the first ever performance. Woo, big deal. So um, hopefully it'll go well. And um, there's some good words they wrote. So we'll just take it from there.
that was that was great. I love when you write your own lyrics. That's pretty cool. And you know, and all of those were were theologically sound lyrics. They were very good, very good. Yes. So today I wanted to talk about something that we've I think maybe we've talked about before, but but that's okay because my memory is short and I can't remember what we what your answers were and also because not all of you were here the last time that we maybe discussed this. But so how many of you know where you, how you got your name? Where your name came from, Lily? They chose your parents chose the name, but was there special reason? Yeah, do you know it? After what? After Harry Potter's mother? Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. I love that. And there's stories that go behind. I mean, yeah, go ahead, Owen. Yep, he, his name came. But we, there was a book that both his dad and I really loved called A Prayer for Owen Meany. And we loved that name. First, we had a cat named Owen, and then the cat ran away. And so then we. We named our first. <laughs> we named our firstborn Owen. That's called betrayal. <laughs> yeah. Harper Lee. Oh, was she? She was born on her sister Harper was born on Harper Lee's birthday. She wrote to named after her. She wrote to kill to kill a mockingbird. Is that right? Yep. Okay. Oh, see, I love that. I love those stories. Anybody? Any of you others know where your name came from? Any parents of these children want to share where their name came from? Anyone? 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 Yep, Jesse. Yes, Jesse's name came from the Bible, and we had all sorts of girl names that your dad and I liked, but we couldn't. It was really, really hard. Yeah, we want. Yeah, we liked the old Norwegian names, but your dad couldn't get on board with the old, the old like Thor. I thought Thor would be great. I, you know. <laughs> but but we both love the name Jesse. So so yeah. Any other stories? I'll give parents one more chance. No. Okay, you can tell me later. But I love hearing how people how names are chosen. And you know, Jesus um Jesus there's a lot of different names that Jesus is known by in the Bible. Uh sometimes he's called the Lamb of God. All these different names, they'd say something different about who he was. The Lamb of God talks about the sacrifice that he was. Or Emmanuel, we hear that during Advent, and that's Emmanuel means God with us, that God was coming to be right with us. And, you know, of course, Christ and Lord means, you know, our ruler, our Savior, we call him. What does that mean when we call him our Savior? Yeah? Yeah, that he saved us. He came to save us. And in the book of John, which is the book of the Bible that we are talking about every week right now, Jesus is called the light of the world. Now, what do you, what's good about light? Yeah? Helps us see, yep. Helps us, yeah? Yeah, helps plants grow. That's a good one. Yeah? Helps us survive. Uh huh. And what else? Yeah? It's a good thing. Yeah, you know, we, can, we can get scared in the dark because we don't know exactly what's there, right? Do any of you have a nightlight in your room? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I even like to have a little light on. You know, so I can see where I'm going. Cause I don't like it when it's pitch black in the night. You have five night lights. That's good. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. And um, and the light helps us to see where we're going. And in the Bible story today that Jane just read for us, there was a man named Nicodemus who comes to Jesus at night, and Nicodemus is confused about some things. And Jesus helps to shed light on his understanding, helps him to understand. And so I hope that for all of us, that Jesus can be our light and to help us to 
to find our way, if we look to him to guide us, he promises to be our light. So let's pray together this morning. Dear God, thank you for this day, and we thank you that that you promise to help us to find our way, that if we look to you and look to your word, that, um, that you will inspire us and give us wisdom for, for this moment and for all the moments to come. Bless these children, God. We thank you for them and the blessing they are to us. And, and we pray for all the children in our community and our world. And we pray these prayers and all the prayers in our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up, and I invite you to go and if you want to get a, a treat, and we'll have some special music from Mira at this moment.
Thank you so much, Yara. sound when it starts to do that. The Lord be with you. So as I talked about last week, right now we're going through the book of John in order. And uh, last week we talked about the story of the wedding at Cana. And today it's the story of Nicodemus. And if you happen to have the Bible memorized, you know that we skipped a reading right in there. And it happened that way just because we had the one guest preacher who was here and so then we missed a reading in there so we're not going to skip it entirely though I want to share it with you so we know that we've we've covered all of them and so after the wedding at Cana what happens is Jesus and his mother and his brothers and disciples they head to Capernaum from Cana that's about a 16 mile distance that they travel they stay there a few days, and then after they leave there, Jesus heads to Jerusalem because it's almost time for the Passover festival. Now that's a longer distance. That's about 100 miles that he travels. And especially when it came time for the Passover, I mean, all the time this, this happened, but especially around this time, there was a lot of buying and selling that was happening in the marketplace or near the temple, at the temple. And this served a purpose. Jews over 19 had to pay a temple tax. It was about two days' wages. And during this time, many kinds of currency existed. There were silver coins from Rome and Greece and Egypt. But the temple tax had to be paid in Jewish coins. And so because these foreign coins were considered unclean, and so people would set up there at the temple to exchange your money. It was a service that they provided. And of course, those who were, who were traveling to come and to bring their, their sacrifice to the temple, and they were traveling from long distances, it wasn't super convenient to bring a ton of animals for the sacrifice with them. And so at the temple, they would sell the animals that you could purchase for, for the sacrifice. This was a great service that they provided, and it, was, it wasn't counter to the law at all. It was very accepted that this happened. The only trouble was that over time, um, these practices started to get kind of sketchy. The money changers providing this service, they, they started to charge an exorbitant rate for the exchange of this money. And even though, yes, you could bring your own livestock, for the sacrifices. It was so much handier to buy the sheep that right there at the temple, but they would just gouge people, you know, for the cost of this handy sheep that they could buy there instead of bringing their own. And so this extortion took place right there. The court of the Gentiles was the only place that the Gentiles could come and worship Israel's God. So the temple was becoming this noisy place of livestock and coins, but it produced incredible wealth for the temple. And so this is the setting where Jesus, you know it's coming, he makes the whip of cords out of, out of strips of leather and chases them all out of the temple. He drives out the animals, he tosses over the tables, Coins spill everywhere. Everywhere He yells, get your things out of here. My father's house is not a marketplace. And the Jews are upset. They say, what makes you think you can talk to us like that? Jesus said, tear down this temple and I'll put it together again in three days. They say, well, it took us 46 years to build this temple. You know, you think you're going to rebuild it again in three days, but... Jesus means his body is the temple. And then later, after he rises from the dead, they remember that he had said this. And so that is the story, then, that, that happens. And 
in between our reading for last week and our reading for this week. And during that Passover festival that Jesus is at, that is where people really start to take notice of Jesus and the signs that he's performing. And they begin to believe in him. And the reason that that story of Jesus driving them out of the marketplace is so familiar to us is we can find it in all four of the Gospels. But the interesting thing to note is that in the other three Gospels, it takes, the story takes place closer to the end of the book. It's closer to, it, it serves as a catalyst for him to be arrested. But here in John, it takes place at the beginning of the book. And also, another difference is, in the other Gospels, he, he calls them a den of robbers. But it's just in John where he says, my temple has become a marketplace. Well, so then, in John, we go, get through the story of the marketplace, and then we come to a story that's only found in the Gospel of John. It's about a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus, a Pharisee who comes to Jesus at night. There's a lot of speculation as to why Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. One of the most common ones is that, you know, he, he doesn't want people to see him with Jesus. He doesn't, they don't, he doesn't want people to know that he's having this conversation. And others say that because in John's Gospel, Things like darkness show ignorance or confusion or a lack of understanding, and that's why he comes at night. But it could simply be because Nicodemus was a Pharisee, and Pharisees did a lot of their studying of the law at night. In the Psalms, it says that our hearts instruct us by night, that the righteous meditate on God on their beds. Nicodemus is a prominent Pharisee. He knows this. And he studies God at night. And, and perhaps this night, the one he's studying and wants to understand more is Jesus. And Nicodemus, being a Pharisee, he prides himself on being someone who knows stuff. You know, He knows the order of the law. He, he knows the oral traditions, the customs, the prophets, the prophecies. He's got it down. He knows his stuff. And so he says to Jesus, Rabbi, we know. We know who you are. And we know what you do. But it, within moments, Jesus makes it very clear to Nicodemus that he doesn't know so well who Jesus is or what Jesus is up to. Have you ever had a conversation like that where you were pretty sure you knew exactly where it was going. You know, you knew, you knew what the outcome was going to be, but then you found out you didn't know exactly what was going to happen. I was remembering a conversation I had one summer night. When I was about 20 years old. I was working at a Bible camp by the Lake of the Woods, and the staff at that Bible camp was very small. There were only about seven of us. And there was one other counselor on the staff. His name was Sean. He was totally dreamy. And <laughs> we spent a lot of time talking. We would talk and talk for hours and hours. And he didn't spend nearly as much time with anybody else except me. And, you know, we were, we were good friends. And, and there was one night where we were, Sean and I were out for a drive. I don't know where we were going. But he's like, Ruth. I have something to tell you. And, you know, I, I knew what he was going to say. I just knew it, you know. I had watched soap operas my whole life. I knew, I knew how this was going to go. He was going to tell me that he was madly in love with me, of course, you know. And, you know, this, that's just the scenario. Cute boy plus, you know, he wants to say something important to me equals this is the big moment. I remember... My fingertips were all tingly, and I could hardly breathe, and, and, and it was all in slow motion. And he says, Ruth, I think I really like Sally. Do you think she likes me? <laughs> Do you think I should ask her out? Sometimes you think you know, but you just don't know. And Nicodemus didn't know. 
he and Jesus have a long conversation that night, but it's Nicodemus only talks for the first few verses, and then Jesus talks the rest of the time. They talk about being born again, and Nicodemus doesn't understand. He says, how can a grown man be born a second time? And, and then Jesus starts talking about water and spirit and wind and God's love expressed through God the Son and eternal life and salvation, not judgment. And he's expressing how faith, it can't be understood with the mind, that it's something that's felt, that the spirit is anything but logical. And this is important to remember as followers of Jesus, that the spirit guides us to places and decisions beyond our planning. We might have all sorts of plans and visions and think we know just how it's supposed to go, but we can't make the mistake of Nicodemus. We have to get beyond our own understanding and always be listening for the movement of the Spirit. Stay open to being surprised. Nicodemus doesn't say anything more after verse 3 of this chapter. And even though the book of John is the only place that we hear from Nicodemus, this isn't the last time we hear from him. Stay tuned, because later on in John, we're going to hear more about Nicodemus, and we're going to find out that the Spirit did indeed surprise him. So stay tuned, and let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the ways that you are with us. We do thank you when you give us moments of certainty and, and conviction that, that help us always to remember that we have to stay open to your spirit moving us and, and trusting that you can do great things through us, greater than we can ever imagine on our own. God, we lift up to you these prayers and all the prayers in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's sing all people that on earth do dwell. Thank you. 